can you share with us a little bit about the underlying dichotomy between data-driven medicine and protocols versus having a more philosophical basis for medicine? Philosophy has become like almost a dirty word in modern education. It's like modern education is getting more and more data-based. But without an underlying philosophy, which is the training the mind how to think in a certain way, we're going to be limited to uh, data-based sets, which we may not be able to adapt to all situations that come to us. We need something a little more flexible rather than a recipe and a protocol. Those can get us in the ballpark. And there's some beautiful protocols, and protocols go all the way back to the Shang Han Lun, don't get me wrong. How the field of the body and the mind works together to produce a framework in which those point combinations or herbal combinations can work. So it's like providing the background for the foreground as we refine our abilities and our techniques, and that never ends. You know, I'm still doing this decades later. You can't pick apart Han Dynasty, at least medical philosophy, which is that humanity resides between Tian Heaven and D Earth, and that we're like an interface between that, and that the human entity resonates with the rest of the universe. And you can see this in terms of modern science as well as we choose to. How I give one example in the book that if Jupiter's orbit was closer to Earth, the gravitational pull would be stronger, and the average height of a human being would be seven to nine feet tall. If Jupiter was further away in space with its orbit, being one of the largest, more powerful planets, um, we would be only three to five feet tall. So these things about heavenly bodies influencing us, it's real, it's science. So these four, where there is a resonance, we know from modern physics that a molecule three million light years away is aware of the movement of a molecule, you could say here in time and space, that the whole universe is a resonant organism, so to speak, that the universe is sentient. How does this resonance occur between doctors and patients? What is that relationship like? And how does that influence the healing process? The healing starts before the patient puts the medicine in their mouth. Because just the realization that they're taking a medicine that I prescribed starts to heal them. There's definitely a lot about the relationship there. So, Yeah, one way or the other, placebo yeah. or nocebo. Right. Which I, I still, quite frankly, have not figured out what placebo or nocebo exactly is. That's no, Ted Kapchuk is doing a lot of research on that. But it's not that I'm concerned with giving sugar wafers to people and to have them get there. Well, that would be pretty cool. Then we just, you know, can just give them Oreo cookies and that would heal everybody, right? There is definitely a physiological healing power in plants and medicine, as you know, and Lan knows. Um, it's a combination of that with, I just see it as really, it's just as chi, exchange of chi. You know, however we choose to define or not to define that. I've been interested in the relationship between placebo and nocebo effect and stress response and nitric oxide, because, you know, that's my, that's my uh, vantage point. It's very interesting stuff. Few people, at least in our Western world, have the chops to do that. I've not been impressed with much of what I've seen other, outside of your work so far, so... I'm very supportive of the work you and Lan are doing. I appreciate it. It's been, um, you know, 10 years of hearing people in the academic community in China talk about some of these ideas over dinner. So, mm -hmm. you know, people who might be curious about turtles hibernating and just looking at more of the systems biology approach, which I know is an area that, um, that you're very interested in as well. I don't really understand some of the technical language of systems biology. I rely on the understanding of others. It's just so much one brain can take in and process and do. But I became interested in the Institute of Systems Biology many years ago in Seattle. It was started by some, uh, Dr. Leroy Hood, who just retired. He's now the emeritus president of it. But it's a real thriving operation up there. And his basic premise reached a time 
where simple cellular analysis and mechanisms is not enough to treat diseases because we're dealing with complexity. We're dealing with a lot of deep-seated problems now, autoimmune disorders and the like, that don't respond to just simple nostrums or one drug. You, know, you see so many patients now, there are multiple medications, but the medications aren't necessarily matched to the entire body-mind system that requires it. He's also written articles in collaboration on Chinese medicine and system biology. He definitely appreciates the work we're doing, and Ayurveda. The way I came up with the internal pharmacy idea was a panel discussion about 25 years ago at UC San Diego of pharmacists. And they were talking about the future of pharmacological medicine. And the conclusion of that discussion was the future of pharmacology is the internal pharmacy, not trying to control the body and the mind through drugs from the outside, but working with the body's own pharmacopoeia. How does this internal pharmacy interrelate with the external environment? The other factor that my book covers, which is the environmental onslaught, which is making people ill. And that um, in the early 20th century, uh, Chinese physicians around the time of the Guomingdong were forced for the first time to defend what was called Yishui before, just medicine, and define it as Zongyi, Chinese medicine, as opposed to Xi, Western medicine. So at the time, they came up with the the differentiation, the differentiation of Chinese medicine from Western medicine would be based on qi transformation, qi hua. That's what would make it unique and different. What I think today, and one of my messages to regular practitioners out there, is that Chinese medicine is an ecological medicine. This makes me think of the old Chinese idea of the five clouds, six climates, the wu yun, liu qi which can be described for those of you who don't know as a kind of farmer's almanac on steroids. Back before the Weather Channel, this kind of helped people predict the weather and climactic factors that can influence human health. I've heard theories that it may have been very accurate at a given time and place, but may need some retrofitting. Other people think it's completely contrived and others just see it as a metaphor for the significance of a larger paradigm for ecological medicine. What is your take on this? That's a great question, and uh, I actually asked a, a, a colleague of mine, Michael Brofman, about this years ago, because he's very much in touch with the Taiwanese medical community. What he said was that in Taiwan, they're actually researching, recalibrating these original charts and so forth to other regions of the world. There's a practitioner in Australia who actually did a research paper I think it was actually his dissertation on applying William Leo Chi to the Southern Hemisphere, specifically Australia and New Zealand. And that work's available uh, as a download, a PDF. So he, he did it for Southern Hemisphere regions, which is quite fascinating. What applications do you see for this on a very practical level, taking it beyond theory and really just applying it to patients, applying it to your own life? my sleep schedules and so forth, digestive cycles, how my mind worked, my clarity of my senses. So that's how I use those teachings, to try to put me in the here and now and understand what it is I'm seeing, why things are changing the way they are, that all illnesses have a natural history, a beginning, hopefully a better clarification in the future. It just expands my sense of time about things. I'm not just looked into... Oh, here's a symptom. Let me treat it, bing, get rid of it. I will think more about the consequences of doing that. Am I shunting it somewhere else? How is it playing into the overall cycle of the person? So I hope that's an answer for that. But it's not a literal use of William Leo Chi. I agree with you. We need much more research on it. And we need to tie in other areas of interest. Um, There's a new book coming out by Christopher Cullen. It hasn't been quite released yet on Chinese astronomy, really in-depth stuff. And the sophistication, not only in the Han Dynasty, but all the way up through the Ming, Qing, and beyond, 
quite amazing what they are able to accomplish in understanding the movements of the stars and the constellations, planets, and the heavens, and their understanding of time on Earth in terms of that. I mean, I'm just... Did astronomy play a role with Chinese medicine as a whole, or was it sequestered to only certain schools of thought? Chinese medicine really should be Chinese medicines, and the throne that the Korean variants, the Japanese variants, regional variants that are almost like cuisine and different lineages and so forth. And we need to respect those understandings. The beautiful thing is that all of, nearly all of them are based on the Han Dynasty medical classics, but there are different expressions of it that have come through. Chinese language, I'm no expert on Chinese language either, like yourself or your wife, but it's very polysemous in my understanding. And one term can mean some very different things in different contexts. So a do, toxin in one context can mean something else in another. So for example, we say the most effective medicines for disease, according to Shenong Bun Jing, are the ones that are the most do toxic, but they're also called the most inferior, the most superior, or the shang, yao, the superior medicinals are those that maintain your health. Wu Wei Xiao Du Yin, for example, which is a warm disease form, which is designed to, it's made from flowers. They're cold, bitter flowers. And it's designed to dispel toxins, those types of toxins that are smelly, sticky, putrefying out of a wound. So there you have a very specific idea of a toxin and how to eliminate it. Can you tell us a little bit about liver detoxes? A lot of the liver detox stuff is almost imaginary, in my opinion. What, it is, what kind of diagnosis is it based on, number one? Number two, what is it that's detoxing? Are you really getting rid of heavy metals? I don't know. I'm a little bit hesitant and skeptical about some of those programs. Or it's springtime, time to detox the liver. So you give a bunch of cold stuff together in a powdered formula. You mix herbs and proteins and vitamins in this huge gargantua thing that costs a lot of money. You don't even know how fresh it is. It's never been tested. You don't know who put the formula together. Is that what we need to do? I don't think so. On the other hand, a very comprehensive, intelligent approach done by Chinese physicians, Chinese medicine physicians, I think could be very useful for some of the toxic overload, which is coming from the environment, environmental toxins, which is definitely an issue. One perfect example of that is the whole gluten craze. There was one study that showed that people who are gluten intolerant in America, when they go to Europe, they can't resist those baguettes in Paris. I'm sure you tasted some really good ones on your trip. You know, you don't get sick on the breads and the, and the uh, flour products over there because they don't spray everything with, is that how you pronounce it, glyphosates? Sounds good. Um, yeah. It's, you know, Roundup, basically. Mm -hmm. And Roundup is not only sprayed in mass on crops and fields in the West, especially GMO, soy, corn, etc. It's also used as a ripening agent for wheat and oats. In other words, they pick it before it's fully ripe, when it's immature, which is already a problem in terms of allergens. And then they spray it with Roundup I don't have easy answers how to get rid of it. But I think that's also different than your routine, not really well thought out liver detox ideas. I hope that's a good answer. Yeah, I'm just thinking when we come in to study in Chinese medicine and are carrying a backpack full of these uh, cultural assumptions and biases, that's, I think, where the, the beauty of your work comes in is getting specific on that foundation. So we can really measure it against our assumptions. And I know I've had assumptions that have been blown out of the water. I think we all have. Well, myself as well, yeah. yeah. Been through a lot of that. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming book? Well, it's actually out now. Um, Return to the Source. Uh -huh. um, it took me a long time to get out a book. And there are a number of reasons for that. Now, I've been in practice since uh, 1983, officially, full-time. Before that, I was a, a shiatsu practitioner, a macrobiotic counselor, a dietary counselor in the health food business. 
And over the years, I've written a lot of articles, but I started teaching at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in around 1989 or so, 1990. And for a year before that at Southwest Acupuncture College, the branch that's in Santa Fe, I kind of took a, I finished up my practice in Denver. I'd been in there for several years and took a year off, had a small practice in Santa Fe and taught. And then uh, made a mutual decision with my wife, we'd move to the West Coast. So starting immediately teaching at Pacific College and quickly becoming department chair of the herbal medicine department, there were just so many responsibilities between full-time practice, raising small children, and teaching that I was able to write articles but never could find the space to actually write a book. Mm. Although the book was always brewing in my mind. In fact, three books were brewing. And I, um, I have a friend, maybe you know him, his name is Ken Cohen. No, excuse me, Ken Cohen is also a friend of mine. Ken Rose up in uh, Marin County. And he wrote a book several years ago called Who Will Ride the Dragon? And another one called A Brief History of Chi. And I started working on a Nanjing book about 15 years ago. And he started working with me on it. And again, it got put to the wayside. Too many other responsibilities, things going on. But finally, a chance came up to actually put something out. And the way I was able to do it is um, I'm a terrible, what I would call, DC writer. DC meaning one-way current. In other mm. words, when I look at a page or a computer screen, it's like I draw a blank. Mm. I needed feedback. I needed someone to dance tango with, so to speak, on the material. And I was teaching a seminar in Massachusetts a couple years ago, and there was a young man there sitting in the front row with a big stack of like classical books, you know, Unshul translations, Shang Han Lun and the like, Jin Gui. And uh, he had a, um, an iPad for one in his um, booty pie, his earth supplementing school, right? Um, Ministerial fire as a concept in terms of uh, how it circulates through the body and warms the body and how the ministerial fire can be deranged in so many ways. And as a result, practitioners mistake heat for underlying cold. In other words, the body's trying to drive out evil cold, but instead they're trying to get rid of what they consider to be evil heat and then weakening the body in the process. Awesome. Well, folks, you're going to find a lot more where that came from if you pick up Returning to the Source, Han Dynasty Medical Classics in Modern Clinical Practice, first edition. This is available on Amazon. I just ordered it myself, and you got to look inside. The table of contents on this is just fascinating. So beyond what Zev mentioned with the ecological medicine philosophy and medical education and um, the internal pharmacy, as well as concepts of time. There are also nuanced explanations of the technician, the medical scholar, the scholar physician, thermodynamics and autoimmune disease. This is really something I've wanted to get into. Visceral manifestations, pulse images, the idea of resonance, which he did cover, and there are also case studies. So it's quite rich conceptually with very direct application to clinical practice. And this is something that I find very beautiful. I'm a big fan of protocols and keeping it simple, but the key to that simplicity, the key to that Picasso principle is over time understanding those deeper underlying philosophical principles as thoroughly as possible so that you can apply them flexibly and freely. And for that, I'm very thankful for this book. I used to carry every herbal formula I could get my hands on. You can just imagine how this clogged up shelf space and mental space. Plus, it gave me a lot to dust every week. We looked at our most effective products, our automatic top sellers, and found that they coincided with the most popular and effective herbal products in East Asia. We decided to focus on the winners and then make them even better. Our research team in Chengdu upgraded these formulas using the highest quality herbs on the planet and rigorously testing them at pharmaceutical standard for quality and safety. 
You'll want to get your hands on this, and you'll get your supplies at botanicalbiohacking.com. Thanks for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Miles.